welcome. Um, it's 65 people. That's got to be a record. I mean, I'm super happy to have you all guys on this uh, on this call. Um, please open up the chat because we are going to be uh, a little bit interactive with each other. Uh, at least I hope we will. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, dive into it. So deep dive into micro front end architecture. Uh, what do we have in store? So let's start with the obvious part. And this is where the interactivity comes in. Open up the chat and write what you think in like two, three words. What do you think architecture is in the sense of software development, obviously. Let's get to it. I'm super excited to see what people will, will say or write. Okay. Andre, it's complex. Yeah, <laughs> you got that right. Mm hmm. Up building structure of a system. Okay. Think about and build the most efficient pieces the best you can. Okay. Style of life. Hmm. Bit philosoph philosophical. I can I can take that. Yeah. That's a good that's a good uh, idea. Okay. So you can still write some 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 comments here um, on the chat. My Al will try to um, sum it up a little bit because none of you got it right. I didn't get it right either the first time. Uh, believe me, I've spent about a year or so figuring out what actually architecture is. Uh, because right, frankly speaking, I used to be an architect on all the levels, like application architect, system architect, even chief architect. And believe me, chief architect is not an architect, it's a manager. That's why I'm not anymore. Uh, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're gonna walk through this disclaimer. And I, I'm sorry that I will read that aloud because I really needed to get across to everybody. So for the purposes of this presentation, the word architecture, will be used in all cases where information exchange happens. Information exchange, which means if we're defining, if we're defining an interface for whatever that might be, that might be just an interface in TypeScript or in some other languages or an interface of a class, because if you're defining a class, some interface comes out of it. Uh, or if you're just writing an interface of a method or a function, that's also some kind of interface that might be a module, whatever it exports a subsystem, whatever the endpoints are to access that subsystem, et cetera. And at the same time, it's really important that we get to both of those things at the same time, that there is a communication medium to exchange information um, using that interface. So it might be stack, heap, so all in memory, in process. It might also be a file. Uh, it might go over in the network. The point being, both of those things, so we are defining a, an interface and defining a communication medium, that is what, in my opinion, constitutes a, um, uh, constitutes a, uh, how should I put it, a proper architecture as a word. Okay, now, before we move on, um, I would like you to click on, right click on my image in the, um, in Zoom client and pin it because that will give me the opportunity to do something like this. So switch between my pretty face and my pretty face and, and an image, okay? If that doesn't work for anybody, uh, please let me know, either in the chat or uh, just speak up. Um, we'll switch to regular Zoom screen sharing. Working for everybody? Yep. yep, seems to be working. Cool, fantastic. Uh, the interface is sort of defining the architecture. Uh, the question 
interesting, right? Because we have architects at work. We have people that share the, that, that hold the title either of a systems architect or an application architect or just an architect or security architect. We've got lots of those uh, very important people, by the way. So what does it mean? What does an architect do? And is everybody an architect to some degree? Well, the, the actual answer is yes, everybody, every single person that does create some kind of code is actually an architect. Uh, you can think of it as um, architecting pieces of a big puzzle. So if you have like those, those puzzles that have 1500 uh, tiles, right? You could put a little bit of it as well and putting all those things together. On all the, you are to some degree an architect. And one more sort of uh, thing that I would like to very much clarify is that architecture is not, um, is not um, a wiki page. An architecture is not uh, a diagram. It's not something that you drew on the board. It's the result, the architecture is the actual result of people writing code. The architecture is nowhere else to be seen, but in the code. So it's a result. It's not something that you design first and then you code against that architecture. It's whatever you coded produces an architecture. It's the result, not the input. It's very important because a lot of people think that, hey, I'm an architect, so I draw, uh, I, I'm drawing diagrams. Not true. Diagrams don't work. Uh, diagrams just are pictures. And seriously, yeah, diagrams are not code. They don't execute, really. So since we have something called the architecture, it should have some principles. And as a result of my um, uh, thought exercise over the last uh, year, I came up with those eight uh, points that a good architecture should um, focus on. And those are in the order of uh, importance. So when we're looking at what an architecture is for, for a developer, not um, like from a developer's perspective, but directly to a developer, what the, a good architecture should provide is ease of deploy, uh, development and ease of deployment. So if we can code something easily, but then it's a pain in the butt to deploy it, then it's not a really good architecture, overall architecture. It needs to allow you to easily extend on what you wrote and fix bugs. So those are really important key points for, for a good architecture. Now there is another side, it's the ops side, where you need to be able to um, provide that application without, uh, uh, without interruptions. It needs to be performant enough. It needs to adhere to some security rules that have been specified by whoever is specifying them. So for example, if you have logging, you need to be able to say, okay, the unwanted person will not be able to log into this application or hack it in any way, which might be kind of funny with the latest log4j um, or should I say log4j2 uh, issues that we've been all facing, as you remember. Uh, not good architecture, by the way, uh, because of security. And accounting. Accounting is basically saying that after some time, I can, with some degree of certainty, say I know what my application did um, over the past um, months or weeks or days, kind of depending on how much accounting you want to collect. Okay, so those are the dev and the ops uh, principles of an, uh, of an architecture. And that boils down to every single thing um, in the code, in the systems, in, in the entire inter uh, internet, if you want to look at it as, a, as one very um, diverse system. Now, the person that we want to talk that we want that I would like to highlight very much is this guy. Uh, that person's name I need to remember, 
I'm sorry, I, I don't have this um, right off the bat. Um, that guy's name is Michael Gels. He's a German. He's, a, he's got a PhD uh, in computer science, and he is largely responsible for the microfrontends architecture. This is the idea that he's got. This is a slide taken straight from the micro-frontends.org uh, website, which uh, kind of makes it for everybody like a, like, a, like a good ad. Like this is what your company will look like on microfrontends. Uh, at least that's the idea that we have uh, vertical teams that can work on their own, providing some kind of uh, elements of the application. The problem with that is that this is, um, if you'll be watching this uh, presentation later on, uh, check out that link that is underneath it. It's a very good page describing um, basically enterprise Kafka-based um, architectures, which is really great. I, I strongly suggest you, you go there and check it out. I like the image so much and it shows exactly how, how things actually are in, in software. And that shows precisely that architecture is not something that you design upfront, that it's something that is the result of you doing some coding and putting stuff together. Okay. Now, the problem is that if you want to go this route, you would have to pretty much start from scratch and continue very rigorously um, proceeding with this slice and dicing of, of things um, from the get-go. Because if you don't do that, you end up with this because of this. So that's how you carve out part of your application and make it a microservice or a micro frontend. Now, there is one more problem and I'm gonna stick with this, um, with this picture here for a moment, explaining the differences between um, microservices and micro frontends. All of those have one common theme, theme not think, theme, that is you can, you can scale your system, your, your company, your, your development team to a bigger size and still provide a small enough um, area for everybody to um, uh, dive in and to understand better. So you don't need people that are working on the checkout process to be uh, involved in the inspire process, right? In the, in the user experience, the first user experience, like the landing page. However, communication between the pieces and that parts of it might be rendered. There's all that usually stems from us taking a monolith application and trying to carve out something out of it so that it is smaller because big things we don't like. The original one, you will see database here, you will see backend and frontend. That is not always true because we've got things like uh, CMSs, like headless CMSs. Uh, Contentful being one of them. I work with Contentful um, in, in my current project. And it's a shared resource between all the teams. So you can't say that, hey, in my case, I've got my own database and this is how I communicate with the rest of the world. Not true because Contentful is being basically shared with everybody. Okay, um, micro frontends. The idea, the original idea, even the name suggests that it comes from the backend architecture called microservices, which is immensely complex. And to do it right, I think everybody who tried to implement microservices in the right way with, <clears throat> with all the quirks like accounting and debugging um, facilities, they will understand that, hey, uh, okay, microservices are not easy. I mean, it's easy to do one of them, but if you wanna go hundred of them, it is gonna be super, super annoying or difficult. Maybe not annoying, 
from my perspective, it's just annoying because the overhead is mostly not, not worth it. When we talk about moving or adopting um, patterns from the backend in the frontend, you will see that we already went through an iteration of that, uh, and that is called the MVC frameworks. I don't think I need to uh, convince anybody that uh, those mentioned on the page here, uh, like jQuery or Sentiatage, uh, those are not things that you want to work with in 2022 or even in 2020, where this article, um, like this article originated in, nine, in 2016, where I would still not use jQuery if possible or Sentiatage. Not to mention Angular, I wouldn't use it for anything, but that's just my personal opinion. So the problem here is that not all the backend proven uh, and solid um, design patterns or architecture styles uh, that are good for backend will work in the front end. We have the precedence with the MVC, which we don't use anymore, gladly. Um, but we do have another one that creeps in, and that's the micro something. In our case, it's micro frontend. The only way to actually implement micro frontends that will mimic whatever is in the backend, and believe me, there is no other way, is to do iframes. But we all know iframes, they require everything to be bundled with them. So you need to bundle the framework, you need to bundle the styles, you need to bundle pretty much everything. And the reason why iframes are the only way of doing that is because those are the only concepts in the front end that allows you to run multiple. In the backend, it's quite easy. You just spawn up a new application on some container and you're good to go. You can have as many, uh, as many micro uh, services as you want. In the front end, it's not so easy because you got a single threaded single uh, process application, unless you're going with iframes, but nobody likes iframes as far as I know. So it's just not doable to do uh, a similar thing or um, with all the properties such as separate deployment, scaling in the backend. So what should we actually and maybe to some degree sane architecture where we are actually capable of working separately on pieces of code. Excuse me, Maciej, uh, yes. sorry, because we all experience connection problems that probably it's yours. Can you do something about it? Or because we have constant lags, like every few seconds, we don't hear you for one or two seconds. Wow, that is really bad. That is really bad. Uh, if I can do something about it, let's try and maybe do this. Let's see if um, I just closed my VPN. I noticed that I still have the VPN uh, on and I just closed it. Let me know if, it's, if it gets any better or not, okay? So, coding. We're gonna be using Vue.js and if anybody's got any doubts Onto why as to why I'm using Vue.js is because I love it, and that's the only reason. So let's get to it. Let's start. Let's scaffold a simple application using Vue. Vue create. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call it main because it's going to be the main application. We're going to use Vue.js three because why not? Let's go with the latest. Machi, by the way, is it better now? For now, it's okay for me, I, I believe. Okay, so it must have been the VPN. Sorry about that, guys. While we are while we're waiting for the packages to in, uh, to install, to bottom line, micro frontends are not microservices because the um, the runtime is very much different. Okay, so either way, we have the uh, we have the main application now. If we do cd main and npm run serve we should see an applications running just um, just fine localhost uh, localhost 8080 and we're seeing an application so uh, let's um, let's see some code here code uh, if the um, if the thing here will be too small if the letters will be too small please let me know as well 
in the meantime, I'm just going to do npm run serve. So that's not server serve, so that the application is running. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kill all those unnecessary things, uh, leaving just the hello world uh, thingy. And I'm going to kill most of it as well because we don't need that thing. It's going to just blur our um, presentation. So this is a super simple component. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Vue.js, we've got props that are for passing in information from outside. And in here, we have a prop being passed, prop called message, which is defined here. That's all you need to know about this for now. And this is the template how the, um, how the application will, so how the, how the component will render. Now, what we want to do in some theoretical case is we want to get this component and we want to make it a micro front end. So a part of the, of the system uh, that will be managed by someone completely different, like some other team, okay? So this should be quite easy. We're gonna take that guy. We're gonna go into our source, uh, sorry, into, into our console. And we're gonna make another uh, uh, folder called MF1, uh, MF1 and PM in it. And we're gonna do this. Um, first of all, we're going to install npm install a few things, uh, and we're going to save uh, that as development, uh, save dev. Um, so for development de dependencies, we're going to use rollup. We're going to use rollup uh, plugin, plug uh, in, uh, plug, if I can only spell correctly, plugin view, because we're going to be working with view. Do we need anything else? Uh, not for the time being. Oh yeah, we need uh, we need view, uh, but view we're gonna need as a peer uh, dependency, and I'm gonna explain to you why in just a second. View at next. Okay, now let's uh, touch index uh, uh, JS, and in that index JS we're gonna just import. Uh, the hello uh, or default as hello world. Actually, we can export that immediately uh, from hello world dot view. Uh, now we're gonna touch the hello world view uh, and we're going to paste in just the code as is. So, we need one more file, a rollup config.js. And in that rollup config, we're going to just import, <clears throat> import view from rollup uh, plugin view and export default configuration, which is going to just say plugins and then uh, view. And let me just check if that is everything that I need. Wait, because I have something prepped already so that I won't make the same mistakes twice. Okay, we need to specify two more things. One is input. So this is gonna be our input file, which is index.js. And we need to specify some outputs uh, or output. And that means we're going to need a format CJS, which is common JS. We're going to use the directory dist, obviously, and exports, uh, we're going to say auto. This means that um, Rollup should figure out uh, by itself what needs to be done for. Um, you know, for those cases where we're exporting both default and some named um, and some named um, exports. Now we want to do dev uh, script, which is going to be basically rollup uh, dash c con uh, rollup config.js, and that should pretty much be it. No dash wait, and we want to 
to actually let's do it the build let's go full um full blown and let's do dev which is going to do npm run build dash 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 wait meaning we want the changes to be uh, basically reload as we change the code so we're going to go ahead and run the build command to see if everything uh, works we have unresolved dependencies uh, what does it mean that we have unresolved dependencies view imported from uh, that means that there is one dependency that we need to make aware, or make um, rollup aware that we're going to be using it, and that is external. Sorry, not export external. And that is basically an array of whatever that thing is. So now, if we run the build, as you will uh, see, it's it's completing in a very short time and no warnings, no errors. Nice. Now we would like to use that micro front end in our main application. So what we are doing is we're going to basically run npm link. And I'm going to just check that node version is the right one and npm version is the right one. Because as you remember, linking works using symlinks. And if you're doing that against a different version of Node or NPM, those are going to clash. So we don't want them to clash. We want them to be uh, to work just, uh, just fine. So we're going to do NPM run def, which basically started the whole thing in a constant rebuild uh, fashion. Now that we have that, uh, let's go into, where's the shell? There it is. Let's go back to, to this guy, and that should be main, yeah. And in here, we're going to do something else. We're going to import hello world. But remember, it's a named export. We, we want to get it from MF1, just like that. And lo and behold, you're going to see that, hey, we don't have MF1, but that's not uh, that's not really um, a problem. And PM link MF1 is going to give us what we need. And we've got uh, one package added, which is nice. And now we're serving. Okay. And now we are presented with this strange thing that we have no ESLint uh, configuration. The reason for that is that um, all the packages. Um, that are being linked using npm link to a Vue.js managed application or Vue.js Vue CLI managed application need to be uh, need to have a an ESLint um, configuration. That's super easy to do because we've got this configuration in here in our original file. So let's do that. Let's take our package.json. Let's put it in, and that should be better. Now let's uh, rerun this thing. And there you go. I wonder if we can make it, uh, if we can show it on the page. Yeah. Welcome to your Vue.js app. Now, how do we know it's from a different, uh, it's from a different place? Let's, um, let's do this. Let's, um, let's close this tab for a moment. Let's go back to our Vue.js and let's add some exclamation marks. It used to work yesterday. It doesn't work today. Great. Yeah, there we go. See, those are the exclamation marks that we get from from the uh, from the library. Okay, so we have successfully divided our application into some kind of library with components. And please be reminded, those could be anything because those are just generic view components. They can provide some functionality. They can, they can work with everything as, um, as, they, um, as they progress in, in their complexity. And since this is a separate repository or separate project, it can be a separate repository so people can work on it independently. Yay, we've got micro front ends. Um, there is, however, a difference to uh, what is being proposed by the original website. Uh, the original website says that we should use the lingua franca of web, which is web components. And I don't think anybody want to do this 
if those web components will also include the runtimes of the framework that we're using for a particular project. So nobody wants to have React twice. Nobody wants to have Vue.js twice. And even in the intermediate steps where you're upgrading from, let's say, Vue.js 2 to Vue.js 3, it's not really a good thing to have two of those um, frameworks uh, at the same time because those are just going to be slow as hell to download for the users. So no, you don't upgrade Vue.js in the middle and you don't provide two versions of Vue.js at the same time. It's even worse with things like Angular and React because React is just like, I don't know, five times bigger than Vue and Angular is n times bigger where n uh, tends to go towards the infinity. So that is how you do micro front ends. Um, by the way, if you have any questions whatsoever in the meantime, please either raise your hand <laughs> or just speak up. Um, I, I, it's going to be more interesting for everybody if I start uh, answering questions rather than uh, talking to myself. So one last thing is to be able to connect both the main application as sort of the host to the micro front end, but the opposite way, sort of um, so that you can provide some facilities for the micro, uh, micro front ends that then the micro front ends can use to either communicate with other micro front ends or to communicate with the top level application. Luckily for us, there is a thing called plugin in, uh, in Vue.js. And how you define a plugin is pretty simple. You export... Um, Excuse me, I just stumbled upon the question uh, before we go further. Um, so we just use common JS, right? To export the components. At this, at this particular, in this particular example, I used uh, common JS, but you can very well use AMD or UMD. It doesn't matter. Okay, really okay. I'm just thinking about, so it could be in different framework just for the sake of... Uh, sure. yeah. okay. Okay. Uh, the thing here that I'm trying to do is I am trying to use a framework and not just based on the um, uh, on the web components because pretty much nobody uses web components. Uh, I mean, for any serious stuff, small drop-ins, sure, why not? Uh, they're they're nice, but then writing an entire application, you would have to work for Google and work on the Google Chrome um, settings to actually use uh, use web components in a proper way. I'm not, and I don't think many people do use web components these days. So that's why I'm focusing on the mainstream frameworks such as Vue, React, not Angular. I'm not touching Angular with a 10 foot pole. Anyways, um, with Vue.js, it's super simple to write a plugin. You just basically export a, by default, you export a component, sorry, an object that has an install method that will take a Vue instance, and then you can do something with it. In our case, let's be super simple. And let's change that and do view dot component. Not components component. Uh, we're gonna say hello dash world, and we're gonna provide it with the with the definition. Okay, but you can always make that a function and say um, that function can take parameters, right? Let's say we want to like connect the micro front end to a message bus. And that way you can, or just say bus dot emit uh, test, uh, test message, right? And that way you can, you can get access to things for inside the micro front end that are inherently provided by the host application. And the host application should be the mediator to in, in communication between all the microservices so that we have just one tree that with one root node and then all the other things hanging from it. So this is how you, how you pass on the, uh, the additional information and how you do a, uh, just for the sake of completeness, how you do a uh, bus is you basically import event emitter from events and then uh, you obviously should also import uh, MF1 from, you guessed it, MF1, and then you need to just use it, MF1. And since this is a function, we can pass on 
event emitter not form from spelling is not easy and now we can pass on that bus we can even say bus on and then say what was the what was the name of the event test message and then we can say okay the test message arrived okay so now we have a way of connecting the main application and providing the micro front ends with some extensibility points or common behaviors, kind of depending on what you're, what you're after. Let's see if that works. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Probably not. I probably did some stupid mistake. Marius, uh, uh, yeah? sorry, I have uh, one idea. Uh, can you share your screen? Because now sure. quality is really low. Yes, better? it's better. Yeah, of course. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I told you, tell me if it's not working. If it's not working, we're going to switch. OK, so it didn't work just, uh, just right off the bat. Let's see why. OK, the test message arrived. We are having some problems resolving the Hello World component, obviously, because right now it's coming. Uh, instead of coming from, uh, from the package, it's already, uh, it has been already um, installed. And now we should, what? Why am I not getting it? Maybe I should name it like that. It shouldn't matter. Yeah, there we go. See? So we have something that originated in the micro front end, the parent as in the, uh, the main application has been notified about it and you can do something about it. You can easily imagine that, hey, I'm passing a message upwards and then some kind of logic will guide whether we should do a broadcast over all the micro front ends or if we should direct the message to a particular micro front end or a group of micro front ends so we have inter-process communication okay or in inter micro front end communication if that makes sense so there you go Vue.js on micro front ends and it's working now there's one problem with that and that problem is that we are not having multiple applications we have multiple repositories. We have one single deployment. So every time a micro front end changes, the main application needs to change to reflect those, those changes. But we do get the, the opportunity for everybody to work on the project, on the main app, fetching all the dependencies, all the micro front ends from a central repository. I didn't say that yet, but this is, this is kind of obvious that if you have this kind of package, and that is being built, you can deploy it to some kind of repository, uh, like NPM maybe, or a local one, Artifactory, whatever that might be. And then when someone just clones the main application, which is this guy here, they can NPM run it or NPM run serve it. All the micro front ends will be downloaded because they will be put into the package.json uh, under dependencies. So we would say basically MF1 is uh, version 12.1.0, right? If we're using some kind of um, versioning uh, scheme. And if this guy will not be able to download, we have, or it will be able because we will deploy it. But if, if you wanna work on it, then you just NPM link that repository that you're working on you run the dev process on it, on that, on that um, repository. You NPM start the, or NPM run serve the main application, and then you can work in the proper context. So you're gonna see everything, every style sheets that are coming from outside, from other packages, from other micro front ends, or from the main application, you're gonna see them and you'll be able to, um, with some degree, with pretty high degree of, of certainty, how the application will look like with your micro front end integrated in it. So instead of going uh, with a monolith application where you would need to compile everything every single time, and we know that can take a while, especially in big projects, you get those pre-compiled, ready to go. All you do is you compile only the, the shell each time, obviously, but it's small because everything else is in the micro front ends. And if you want to work on part of it, you just npm link it 
and that's it. Um, any questions about that so far? Uh, from my perspective, it's something that could be uh, disconnected from the word micro frontends because we just work on different uh, micro repositories and we could treat it like uh, just a pack of visual components. And so, but isn't that exactly what this thing shows us? Isn't that exactly what the micro frontends architecture tells us to be able to do? At least at the top part where the front end is. I mean, yeah, but um, I also I'm also familiar with the page, and it's uh, essential about the deployment. So, um, the deployment should be separable. And those are. And those are because you are deploying to an npm registry. Now, deployment is something that we need to really focus on, because if we're talking about deployment, then deployment happens when code is put in runtime and executed, that's deployment. We have the same thing with, micro, um, with microservices where uh, the fact that you have a jar file or a, a, an NPM package somewhere in the registry, it doesn't really do much. You could deploy multiple versions and nobody will care, right? Nobody will even notice. I mean, clients, they won't even notice. What they will notice is when they try and fetch some static resources from some place and they put it in the browser and the browser then executes it. That's the deployment phase, the actual deployment phase of a uh, front-end application. So if you wanna split that deployment into publishing and deployment, then publishing is what needs to be separated, not deployment. Deployment is kind of different beast altogether. Publishing uh, on the other end, it could be it could be leveraged here, and that's what this approach with micro frontends as libraries uh, brings um, uh, brings to the table. It allows you to split the deployment, sorry, not the deployment, the publishing, so that until you're working on it, you can do separate things. But then in the end, the client will get not multiple applications; they will get just one application because that's how the browser works. It's not the backend; it's the front end. It's kind of different. And I don't know if you know this, but hey, our framework for, or our platform is actually V8 in, in Chrome or any other browser for that matter. I'm so sorry, but I just uh, got like a dropping connection when you said uh, your, your application is actually, and then I missed everything. Okay. Your application is running in the browser, and that is a single-threaded, single-process application, single-process environment, right? Yep. And if you want to do deployments, actual deployments, then you do deployment of code into runtime environment. So that happens when the user types in the address and presses enter, and that's when the actual deployment happens. The publishing process is sort of a step in the middle that we can control. But the deployment we cannot control. We we are not in control, not fully in control of when the deployment actually happens. Does that make sense? Makes sense a lot, and I kind of agree with the deployment definition in terms of front end. I'm just wondering about the ability of a one small team to actually be able to uh, update the code for the user uh, without any changes in any different application. So this is what I would, what I meant by deployment. Oh, okay. Okay, um, we can pick it up later on. I know we, we have some uh, some things, some errands to run uh, either way. We've seen each other, we've not seen each other in ages, so maybe we yeah, can true. pick it up afterwards. <laughs> okay, anybody else, any questions? Guys, if nobody will ask a question, it's gonna be boring. It's just gonna be a talking head on the other end and you sleeping, so. Okay. Anyways, if there are no no questions, let let me just um, let me just continue. So um, we've got um, eight things to remember. This is like if you don't get anything other from this uh, application from this presentation, I would like you to remember those uh, those principles. Like anything else, be that micro frontends, deployment, publishing, all those crazy things that I talked about. 
if you don't remember anything of it, that's fine. But at least remember there are eight principles of, of a good architecture and that the architecture is the result. It's not the input. Okay, so everything else is not really uh, important other than, than that. And make sure that you first and foremost, when you're designing something, like let's imagine you're an architect, okay? So you got the big pay paycheck, you're very well respected. And for the other guys, well, if you work really hard and you're if you're really, really lucky, you're gonna be an architect someday. So remember this, that you used to be a developer and that you probably already have met some crazy architect that he had some that had some crazy idea that was mapping nowhere to be to be coded in code okay so the the idea might have been sound and a great example of such a such an architecture is the java server faces uh, framework you might have heard about that especially because i'm advertising as uh, advertising this as don't do that ever uh, and if you're interested just check out the i hate jsf dot com page, which since 10, well, 12 years has been gathering feedback about from people, from developers all over the world about how um, how annoying JSF was for them. So here, here we've got someone saying, I quit my job thanks to JSF. I think that speaks enough, okay? Um, there's some swear words. It's basically like, uh, this this page is basically something like you, you would hang on the wall, uh, like a si single cigarette, uh, a match, and with the with this header like in case of emergency break the break the glass. So this is this is this kind of page, and as you can see, a lot of people needed it. So, um, and it still continues to this day. Like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Uh, and so on, like people really need that. So if, you, if you're gonna design as an architect, if you're gonna design something that's beautiful from the architectural standpoint, standpoint but it's gonna be a pain in the ass to work with, people will create pages like that. So don't do this. At least not something that you publish on the, uh, on the page, uh, on, on, you know, publicly and make people work with it. Okay, um, that was pretty much everything I had for you guys today. Remember the eight principles. Remember that you might be an architect at any given time. You might not be paid as an architect. You might not share the title or hold the title of an architect. But if you're working with code, if you're just working with two elements that talk to each other, then you are an architect. And you can either make it a pain in the butt for anybody else later down the road to work with it. If you use scriptic names, for example, uh, and if you make everybody like extend everything just to implement some small small adjustment to your uh, to your um, code, or you can make it so that it is easy and fast to work with. In my case, my goal with this um, with extracting this as a um, as a separate um, library was that I can keep those things running. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe it will work this time. Well, let's see. Maybe we can we can check out if this will work because it used to work. Re-render. Okay, re-render worked, but you still have to at least press F5. Yesterday it worked without pressing F5. It was magic. So micro frontends don't really sit well with everybody else, uh, at least from the code perspective or developer experience perspective. So remember, there is always a trade-off, but you should look at developers' productivity, so ease of development and ease of deployment first before you do anything else. If it's gonna be a nightmare to work with, just don't do it, period, just no. If it's not gonna be extensible, just don't do it. Figure out something that will make it extensible. If it's gonna be a pain to maintain, don't do it. Like figure something that's gonna make it easy to maintain and so on and so forth. And that is it, basically. I, I have a question. Uh, so uh, how can you tell beforehand that it's going to be difficult to work with or you know, like all these, having all these is issues that you mentioned? That is a fantastic question, thank you. 
You don't. You don't. I am 100% sure that the people who designed the architecture of um, JSF, so Java Server Faces, they were absolutely sure that they are creating something that will solve everybody's problem. And it does. It only creates another problem for the guys that have to work with it. But in the end, it is a framework that does everything. So if you created something and you're super proud of it, and then someone else comes back to you and says, hmm, you know, it does so many things, but it's such a bitch to work with, you should probably redesign it with that feedback in mind, okay? So look for the feedback, not what you like, what you created. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, sure. Yeah. And it comes back to the point that architecture is the result. It's not the input. It's the result. Okay, everybody, uh, you can find me on Facebook or on GitHub where this presentation is being stored. So you can take it and do it to your friends um, if you'd like to. I don't mind, it's open source. Okay, Maciej, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Uh, what else alone with these eight principles we have to understand in micro front -end's approach? Maybe what else I mean deep and technically? Deep in technically, well, you have to understand that the browser is not an endless pod where you can put in everything and it will still be afloat. It will still work. Um, you should minimize the um, the code that you're that you're outputting to the to the browser because less is always better. You should probably keep in mind the solid principles, which, by the way, extensibility is essentially just saying. Please obey the open close principle. Uh, whereas um, ease of development is more like Yagni, you ain't gonna need it, so don't do it. Um, high availability is just don't do stupid, stupid things like sharing state between everybody and then you know being forced to synchronize that state. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So less is always better because you like remember, code is always more often written then executed. Code is um, maybe not executed, but translated to whatever the machine understands. It's ju done just once. Okay, you've got some code, you translated it, then it's computer code. You don't, you don't wanna read minified and uglified code, right? But you, what you will read is the code that someone else wrote. So if you have a code generator, for example, that's great. Just don't commit the, the code to the repository. If it's generated, it's freaking generated and period. If you need to do some changes to it, do the changes to the generator. If you can't do the changes to the generator directly, then do some pre or post processing, uh, but don't modify generated code. The same applies to create React app where you do eject to modify the build system. The moment you ejected those configurations, uh, they become your responsibility. Nobody else will care. Well, if you don't eject them and you upgrade the create React, React app services that are making the whole thing run, then yeah, obviously you upgrade the create React app services and then you get the latest um, that is um, provided with create React app uh, services. But if you eject it, then you're on your own. So as less as the, le the, the least code you can have, the better. The more readable code you have, the better. If you really need to split things in the front end, especially in the front end, then do libraries. Those are probably the technical pointers that I would give to someone who's asking about uh, what else besides those, those uh, eight principles. Thank you very much. There you go. That was a good question, by the way. Yep. yep. Can I ask something? <laughs> sure. Uh, what is what about drawbacks of this approach? You know, and maybe some good examples when we should use it and we should not. Because you know, my understanding is that it's like a bit overloaded uh, in case of I don't know mm, efforts for like uh, scaffolding this or starting up and ma maintaining. So uh, and really, I. 
it's quite difficult to imagine a good example, you know, when, when we should use it. Except like when we have 10 teams and want to like make the, their work easier. Okay. Um, it's actually a very difficult question to answer. Uh, my idea of a good answer for this would be uh, just don't do micro frontends if you don't really have to. If you really, really, really are struggling now and the room to breathe is just very limited and you stumble upon a, uh, everybody else all the time, then yeah, go ahead and do micro, uh, micro frontends. Uh, but if you don't, if you're happy with a monolith, remember, it's still going to run as a single application on the front end. It's not going to, like the fact that you're splitting it, it doesn't mean it's going to change anything in the browser. It might make things difficult for you. So you do as, as many things as you can towards making it easy to develop and deploy and all those other principles. But if you don't have to, just don't do it. You're going to be happier. Everybody else on the team will be happier. Although the, the application might grow with time, uh, design the file system so that it is easy for people to figure out which part is mine and which part is theirs. Okay, you can do that in GitHub using um, the code owners um, file. It will tell you, hey, this guy should review this PR because it touches this portion of code. And if you have interchanging, like, like um, cross-cutting uh, PRs, then it will automatically uh, broaden the, uh, the set of people that will be involved in the PR review. Uh, so there you go, you can, you can do that. But if you really, really, really must, like, what one reason for this, like a good reason for this to work would be if your build system is struggling to provide you fast feedback from your code changes to the browser. You know, you're doing some changes in, in the code and then you need to wait for a minute and you would think that's impossible, but then take a look at Ember.js in a big application. Then we're going to talk. But um, because Ember.js is inherently, like they, they've got this build system called Broccoli or Broccoli, Broccoli, I guess it is. Like Broccoli must die from the uh, family guy, uh, Stuart said that. And in this case, also Broccoli should die. But that was just, um, just my opinion here, okay? The point is, if you don't have to, you don't do it. That, that, that same thing as with, with Redux and React. You don't need it until you know you need it, then you need it, then you should use it. If you don't need micro frontends, if your application is still performant enough in terms of development, if it's not slowing you down, then you don't need it, you don't do it. Yep, interesting because uh, as I understood, we should cook micro frontends from scratch and it's <laughs> very difficult to, you know, to refactor that. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of, Cycle dependency. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know why I had to include that picture, right? Because people do tend to extract micro frontends out of the code. And this is more or less how it looks like in the end. <laughs> I got like feelings that it's kind of mainstream currently, but uh, yeah, I see sometimes now that, yeah, we're using micro frontends. But personally, me, I don't have really good reason, you know that we should do that. We can just make components and some kind of set and Vue.js or React could provide us that. So, yeah. You're absolutely yeah. correct. Uh, most people don't need micro frontends. Most people, most projects. I would even go as far as to say 99.9% .9 of projects will not benefit, will actually suffer from inducing um, the complexity that comes together with, with micro frontends will suffer. Yep, we had experience with like mediator and mm -hmm. some kind of, uh, it wasn't micro frontend, but you know, and mediator is, was really painful, you know. That's why when I hear mediator, I'm starting to, think more about the seeds. <laughs> you know, I wanted to show you something because the, I found that really interesting. So this is the Manning page for the micro frontends in action page, uh, sorry, book uh, that uh, Michelle wrote. 
And um, I usually tend to pay attention to details. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion, please take it with a huge grain of salt, okay? In my opinion, the guy wrote this thing because he had an idea and then for some reason it just cut up and he's making money with it. How do I know this? Because if you don't buy the book, you will not know what micro frontends are all about. So it's a complex thing and it's fine. You just buy the book, you read it, you know, right? Then you will probably want to do something like you want to check out the code that is in the book. And I did that. And lo and behold, this is what happens. I just downloaded the, the uh, micro frontends, um, or I'm downloading, I downloaded the, the, the code and look what's inside. Well, I wouldn't call this source code, <laughs> right? Um, okay, uh, we could probably figure out something um, about this and it, it sure is available. Um, you can you can see the micro frontends in action code on GitHub, lots of code. <clears throat> but then if you go to micro frontends, um, uh, the the homepage of micro frontends, you will know that, that page came to life like in what 2016 or something. And you scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. All those different things. They're all about mostly about extending HTML elements or creating um, custom uh, custom components and then marrying it all together with server-side includes, which is, well, I'm not gonna comment on that, no. But then navigating between pages to be continued and he promised and it it's still not there six years later. So in my opinion, there was an idea for a specific project for a specific situation. He, he got the name right, very, very much right. And then it died. So I would say the concept, although catchy, it's more a clickbait than anything else. Yep, yeah, but I saw some kind of library or utility. Is it currently Supported and it's like helps to create micro front ends. Uh, I can't recall how it's called, but yeah, people using them. Yeah, there is like a ton of ways that you can approach this. And I'm sure people will come up with ready made solutions for, you know, making it easier. It's never going to be easy, but it's going to be easier than just ramping everything from, from scratch. I, I wanted to share with you in the end um, one last thing that I, that, I, that I did. I did it yesterday and I did it specifically because of this presentation and I did it specifically so that you know you shouldn't do micro frontends unless you absolutely know what you're doing and you have to do it because otherwise everything's gonna crumble. I've created this issue yesterday. Please stop propagating the micro frontends approach. Um, we had a nice conversation, so you can you can read that if you want to, uh, if you get to it. Um, it says all the things that I told that I was talking today um, during the presentation. Uh, the bottom line being, working with front end is hard enough. Don't make it harder for no reason. Selling dreams that never come true. Uh, so he re replied to that. You, you could you could read the, the uh, his explanation. But we parted ways basically with uh, we can agree to disagree. So let's let's stick with that. Um, anyways, this is this is just uh, just the one thing that um, I think would make uh, sense to to be as a closure for for this uh, for this presentation. Cool. Thank you. And as always, you can find me on Facebook and on GitHub and on Twitter and LinkedIn under Adcom.